This week on Dialogue, leaving Iraq, mission accomplished? Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. James Zogby is founder and president of the Arab American Institute. Dr. Zogby is an author, a lecturer, a scholar, and also hosts an award-winning TV program, Viewpoint, with James Zogby. His latest book is titled Arab Voices, What They Are Saying to Us and Why It Matters. Rajiv Chandrasekharan is a senior correspondent and associate editor for the Washington Post. He was bureau chief in Baghdad for the first two years of the Iraq War and is the author of Imperial Life in the Emerald City, an account of the American effort to reconstruct Iraq. Currently, he's a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center working on a book on, Afghani on Afghanistan. Gentlemen, welcome to the discussion. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. So we are closing in on the deadline for withdrawal of the troops. Uh, it may be a, a, an oversimplification, but if you were trying to, fi to say which it is more of one or the other, is this more a strategic military decision or is this more a domestic U.S. Polit political decision? Well, it's both. And clearly the American people have war, war fatigue yeah. on this and on Afghanistan. Um, but it's also an issue that Iraq was insistent upon not only in terms of this deadline, but when the, the, the agreement was reached with the Bush administration uh, two years back, three years back. So I, I don't think we had a choice. Um, I think that there uh, are those who would have sought a better option, but uh, I don't think that there was a, a possibility of extending this either given U.S. or given Iraqi public opinion. Roger, your thoughts on this. What are the military people saying? Well, of course, the, the, the U.S. military wanted to have a, a substantial presence there uh, into the future. Uh, they, would have, they would have been uh, happy with a, with a troop level uh, in the five figures, you know, north of 10,000. Uh, they felt uh, was important for the continued training of Iraqi forces, to, uh, to send a message to neighboring Iran, um, and also for, 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 for broader uh, what, what they saw as the, the, the projection of, of American force uh, throughout the region. Um, but, of course, th that was a number that was just simply too high for, for, uh, for the Iraqis uh, and, and even for uh, the White House. And so, uh, you know, the negotiations that in ensued were, were over a smaller number, uh, somewhere between, you know, three to 5,000. And, you know, at that level, it, it really, uh, a question arose, what, what sort of influence do you really have with, with, with such a small a figure like that? But uh, it was still seen at the Pentagon to be um, important to, to keep an American flag planted there for the military. Um, you know, now we, we move into this new phase, and, and, and I agree um, with James that, that uh, this, this, this ultimately came down to an issue of what the Iraqis wanted. And, and they wanted U.S. forces to leave. I don't think this means that um, U.S. forces will, will never be back in Iraq. I actually think that now perhaps the way is paved for the Iraqis to invite uh, American and, and other NATO forces back in, 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 in training capacities, perhaps to do joint exercises. Um, but I think they needed to cross this threshold before moving forward. And... Uh, uh, there was also the issue of sort of domestic Iraqi politics. Um, had, had the United States pushed the Maliki government much harder to keep those forces there, uh, you know, between offering greater emoluments to, to that government by perhaps uh, stepping back from some of the conditions uh, about the immunity of, of U.S. soldiers and such, it, it could have subjected the Maliki government to some pretty significant internal backlash that could have, at the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, presented some even greater challenges to U.S. interests uh, in Iraq and beyond. It, uh, a senior Pentagon official said that 200 to 300 military trainers will remain at 10 Iraqi bases. Is this enough to make a difference for the U.S. as far as a presence, or is it enough to make a difference as far as objections from Iraqis who said, hey, wait a minute, I thought you were leaving? There are those, there are those Iraqis who will uh, object to any U.S. presence. Um, 
it is not a significant presence. Uh, the more significant presence is going to be the embassy and quote unquote contractors, mm -hmm. uh, whose numbers will be very high and will be, uh, I think, of, of should be of concern to Americans. Um, talk a little bit more about that. This is the under the radar story. Is that we talk about the military numbers, but so much of military operations these days have been farmed out to contractors, and it's a huge number. It's a huge number, and it's a huge number of casualties that have been incurred by contractors. And we don't talk about them, but they are a problem, and they have been a problem for us in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, behaviors that have been unacceptable, they get, uh, reflect badly on, on, on the United States. Uh, but given public opinion and what public opinion was willing to tolerate, we were able to talk about military, we were able to uh, sort of pat ourselves on the back and saying we're withdrawing, but the the contractor presence will be will be very high. I don't think it makes a difference in terms of U.S. strategic interests in in, in Iraq. And, and at this point, I think that we're in a uh, a no-win game in 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 the country. It, it was a a war that was uh, uh, badly conceived, very badly executed, and has no good end. Um, and therefore, uh, the administration will get short-term credit for leaving. But it's going to be long-term headache for this administration, but also for the United States. Jim in invokes the, uh, the original intent uh, of why the U.S. is in this country in the first place. Uh, let's rewind the tape before we focus on the withdrawal and, and talk a bit more about that. You were there at the beginning of the war. Uh, take us back to this notion that we were going to uh, quickly build a democratic foothold within the region that there would be cheering in the streets, greeted as liberators, the whole, the whole what it turned out to be neocon fantasy. Oh, and, and, and before even that, there was the, we would go and uh, seize their stockpiles of biological and chemical weapons ah, that the they had. WMD. So WMD, yeah. WMD uh, was, was, you know, the initial uh, pretext for this. And then, of course, when that wasn't found, this was going to be a, a grand mission of nation building and democratization uh, that, that we would be greeted warmly. And in fact, the reality was in those early days, we were warmly greeted. I mean, I witnessed Iraqis, uh, you know, handing cans of Pepsi to, to American troops because there was the sense that the Americans would come, they would get rid of Saddam, and then they would leave. Mm -hmm. And things turned sour when the Iraqis never got a clear answer as to when, what the in true intention of the American forces were. And then, of course, in the removal of the Saddam government, without a real genuine plan for what came next, uh, as the Americans sort of cast about trying to figure out how to create a transitional administration, bringing in some much reviled exile figures to participate in a pseudo-governing council with the American Occupation Authority, this further inflamed tensions, as well as a number of steps that were taken by the U.S. Occupation Administration back then, led by Ambassador Bremer, to essentially disenfranchise Iraq Sunni minority, which further fanned the flames of the nascent insurgency. And then as that Sunni insurgency kicked off, and just to sort of fast forward over the, next, you know, these, these, the following few years, of course, they, they targeted not just Americans, but they targeted the Shia community in Iraq. That then led to the further growth of, of Shiite militias both in terms of an act of self-preservation on, uh, on the part of the Shiite community, but also uh, in part uh, the pot stirred by neighboring Iran, and you got into a full-fledged civil war. Mm -hmm. we, did our first, we did our first television show live with Baghdad um, in May. We had done one in March, right before the war, um, and it was very clear that those who we were talking to on the campus of the University of Baghdad did did not want America in, involved. You might say that they were mostly Sunni, they were the sons and daughters of the privileged class, et cetera, um, but their reaction was, was quite hostile. Uh, we did it in May, early May, uh, shortly after mission accomplished, and um, I remember asking the question, was this liberation or occupation, and 80% of the hands went up saying occupation. When, when asked to describe why, it was because of the absence of security. It was the absence of services. It was the fact there was no power. There was no water. Uh, Baghdad was a mess. And people said, look, we used to have to worry about the Mohammedat. Now we worry about everybody. Uh, we don't know what to do, and we're afraid to go on the streets. When we did our first poll in October of that year, 
55 percent complained of being badly treated by the U.S. military, and two-thirds wanted America gone. What I found striking was uh, the poll was released, and two days later I turn on television and there's Dick Cheney on Meet the Press. And he's saying, new poll, Zogby, very credible, reputable firm. Uh, they want America to stay. They want to be just like America. And he was going on fabricating the results. And I, I thought to myself, it's one thing to fabricate the, the intelligence going in. It's another thing to be told this isn't working and insist on fabricating how, that. How did you respond to that when you heard your poll? Oh, I wrote an article. I, I call, they called it Bend It Like Cheney when they published it. <laughs> I, I was furious with him. Sure. And, and um uh, we did our best to, to tell the story. This is what's going on because American lives were at stake and continued to be at stake. Is it, what both of you describe, is there some alternate reality where we could have gotten this right? It, no. It, from, the, this... from the get-go, this was badly conceived. This should not have happened. It was a, a neocon, I called it an infantile fantasy. The notion that you would go in, big explosion, everything would fall back into place nicely democracy would flower and bloom across the whole Middle East was nonsense and it was uh, th th what troubles me till this day is the lack of accountability not for the weapons of mass destruction only but for this fantasy and the fact that they got it wrong from the get-go and they dragged us into a war they in a country they did not know did not understand Go ahead, I agree Raj, that, that, that the democratization argument was was a fantasy but I believe that had in those early days, the U.S. approached the initial phases of post-Saddam Iraq differently, we could have had a less worse outcome. I'm not saying perfect. I'm not saying that there would not have been high costs and bloodshed for all involved. But had we sent in American troops that, that actually had some equipment uh, and signs to stop Iraqis at checkpoints instead of having to shoot into their cars, had we come up with a reasonable plan for a transitional government, had we brought in some meaningful resources to bear for short-term reconstruction that would have helped convince the Iraqis that we were there to help them, not just for our own purposes. I think we could have um, attenuated the initial strength of the insurgency, and we could have set the entire country on a different trajectory. And, and I don't think we would have had to have had uh, a, a conflict that was as bad as it was. But so it wasn't just the initial invasion that was based on, on false premises, but, but what came after it for the first many months was, was, was quite literally a disaster. Why did uh, the American public fall for it in, in the sense that what you, what you both described sounds like a pretty cut and dried case that this was ill-conceived, that it was a moving target of why we were there for WMD, then we were there to liberate people from Saddam. Uh, and we we'd gotten, war, we, so why we'd got, people... we'd gotten used to wars on the cheap. Uh, the Serbia war was, was one where no American soldier even fought. Um, we used missiles. That was all. And it was clean and easy. And, and we looked like the winners. The, the Gulf War uh, yeah, with, with, with Kuwait was the same kind the of video thing. Game we, had a few, like. we had a few losses, but, but just a few. And mm -hmm. it was a manageable amount, we thought. Um, and so there was the sense that, you know, shock and awe, uh, we would overwhelmingly use force. Uh, there was the intelligence that they had from the Iraqi uh, dissidents who said, flowers in the street. I mean, that's what the Shelby people were saying. Mm -hmm. um, and they had been talking to themselves for years and were convinced of it, not unlike the Syrian opposition today or the Libyan folks, etc. I mean, they're, you know, the opposition will say and do anything they have to do to get you in. Uh, we believed it. Um, and the fact that we didn't know the country and didn't understand it, either its terrain or, I mean, its, its socio-political terrain its culture, its and history. its culture. We saw ourselves as going into Germany after World War II. They saw us as the Mongols coming to sack their, their city. And the Arab world did as well. And everything flowed from that faulty view of Iraqi history and culture from the, from the get-go. I, I, I agree with you. It could have been less worse, it still would have been god-awful. And we, what, we're with, what, we're, what we're leaving Iraq today is still one-fifth of the population either refugee or internally displaced, and a dismembered social body, uh, body politic that will never reconstitute itself. Its, it's middle class, its professional class are gone. So will it break apart? The Christian community is gone. I don't know will if it, it breaks apart, nation? but it holds together at best quite tenuously.
I mean, the, 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 very, pe the very human capital, the people that you need to, to rebuild and grow that society, they're, all, they were, they're the educated classes. They had means. They've left. They're here in the United States. They're in Europe. They're in Jordan and in Syria and Egypt these days. Will and I doubt very many of them. Back? No, I don't think no. very many of them I will. I think they're afraid to, for the most part. Still, the Christians, for example, no way you're going to get them back. And let's understand that the concern I have about accountability um, and finding a, a, not a less worst way, but understanding the, the initial, the original sin of this war, is that there's the danger that we do it again. Um, if we can only find a less worse way. I don't think there's a less worse way. There's really no way. We have to be much more careful. I still think the Powell Doctrine makes so much sense to me. We didn't listen to it then, and we're still not listening to it now. Is, are we listening any better about anything? Because, we, we, as you said, we didn't understand the culture. We didn't understand the history. Are we more in touch to those things? Have we been humbled in any way? I think the president has, and this president from the speech he gave in Cairo on has been very clear about understanding the limits of American power, understanding the the damage that was done to the American brand and wanting to rebuild it. I said after the Cairo speech and some of the, the shows I did with some folks on the other side, uh, listening to the harsh rhetoric against the president, and I was asked the question, can we ever rebuild these ties with that, that world? And I said, it's going to be easier for us to do that than it's going to be able to rebuild ties with the Republican Party here in America. They won't give him an inch on rebuilding these relationships and rebuilding the American image. They want, they didn't learn the lesson of the Iraq war and they want to do it again and again and again. And I think it's a terrible mistake. But Jim, let's, let's, let's consider Afghanistan. I and mean, that's the counter argument to all of this. Um, you know, this president decided to, to uh, approve a request from his commanders for, for, for significant addition of forces there. Obama uh, doubled the American troop presence in Afghanistan. They're mounting the same sort of comprehensive counterinsurgency strategy that the military believed turned around Iraq, and I think there's a lot of room for debate on that particular claim, but that's the strategy that the United States is using now. Surge so, too. Yeah, so when I look at Afghanistan, it's hard to say we've been humbled by Iraq that, it's, that we're doing anything different. I think the, the takeaway was, ah, surging forces and pouring in more reconstruction resources turned around Iraq, so it's got to work in Afghanistan yeah. too. In fact, I think Iraq perhaps has given us a very dangerous lesson going forward, particularly for the military. Jim, tell I, us about I, your survey. I think you're right. You're and right. and uh, what you're learning about what uh, people in the Arab world if we can use a term and include people in such a way. Uh, what are they saying? What are they thinking about this U.S. withdrawal? Is this helping the U.S. image, or is it just it's about time? It, it was expected. Uh, it was insisted upon. Uh, the Arab world is, is almost uniform, uh, two-thirds to three-quarters uh, in every country, uh, saying the U.S. should leave, and uh, with, without exception. Um, interestingly enough, the one place where you don't get that consistency of, of, of view on the withdrawal is in Iraq itself. And politically speaking, given the political parties in Iraq, there is insistence. You cannot negotiate this, uh, this departure. It's got to happen. That's what the Muqtada al-Sadr people say. That's what most of the major groups within al-Maliki's coalition are saying. But Iraqi public opinion is very different on that. They're worried. They want America to leave. They're, they're conflicted is the word I use. They overwhelmingly want America to leave. They're scared stiff what happens when we leave. And, and they're specific about what they're afraid about. They're afraid about the country falling apart. They're afraid about the, res the, 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 the resurgence of al-Qaeda and terrorism. They're concerned about um, the economy, whatever little gains have been made uh, going south, um, et, et cetera. But in the Arab world, you don't get those concerns, with the exception of Jordan. Jordan is the one country where we poll where the views are almost identical to Iraq. Uh, but in the rest of the Arab why, world... Why do you think that is? Why? Because they pay the price. Mm -hmm. They in Syria pay the price. They'll get the spillover if something reignites. And they have family ties. They're very close to the people in Iraq. When you go to Egypt, for example, it's just anti-American sentiment. Get them out. Everything will be rosy when America leaves. Um, a real sense of optimism about the future of Iraq when America goes, an optimism you don't find in Iraq itself. Mm -hmm. and I, I, th I think that the, the public apprehension in Iraq actually speaks to this broader question of, you know, what's the narrative under which 
U.S. forces are leaving? And is this, is this a, you know, do we finally sort of notch a victory, or is it something far more complicated than that? And I think, you know, the very fact that the Iraqis are so conflicted, on one hand, their pride and their nationalism want, lead them to want Americans to leave. Uh, you know, a strain of pragmatism and, 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 and genuine fear leads them privately to say, well, you know, I hope they're just over the hill so they can come back in if things turn bad. Because fundamentally, the, the tensions in Iraqi society, uh, tensions is too soft of a word. I mean, the outright, you know, disagreements, conflict, fundamental divisions in society have not been addressed through the search. And uh, admittedly, these were divisions that preexisted the presence of the United States. But we, the, 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 the military occupation and, 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 and what followed did not, um, didn't, didn't take meaningful steps toward the resolution there. And so there are still real fundamental issues and grievances is that it, have to be resolved. Is it possible when you say haven't been addressed, uh, they were artificially kept down under Saddam's regime? And then have they similarly been artificially kept down because of the U.S. invasion? And now is it possible that essentially all hell breaks loose and we, we're looking at a civil war scenario? Well, you know, the ethnic cleansing took place. I think one of the reasons the surge was successful was because much of the ethnic cleansing had taken place before the surge started, so that the neighborhoods yes. were already divided. And, and the, the troops could be applied right. as sort of buffers between right. communities. Walls were already up in neighborhoods separating, uh, separating different groups of people. The, and the, the point is that bl blood has been spilled. Can it? Can can you go back to where you were? I don't think so. When we did we did a show with Iraqis um, four years in, uh, surge had happened. We were debating withdrawal, etc. And I, I remember uh, one of the questions that my American kids we it was a dialogue between American kids and kids in Iraq were, was about the Sunni Shia split. And the kids in Iraq were, on the one hand, baffled by it, because they, they said, look, my, my mom is Shia, my, my dad is Sunni. In fact, most of the kids in the audience in Iraq came from families that were mixed. This was Sarajevo. Baghdad had been like Sarajevo. It had been like Beirut. Mm -hmm. they, they had ethnic tensions. They had, they had uh, uh, sectarian tensions. But they also had reached an accommodation, and they had worked it out in social relationships. Um, it was the leadership of the sect groups that fomented this, not the Iraqi people themselves. I think the Iraqi people can work out a modus uh, uh, vivendi with, with, with one another. Um, I'm not sure the political leadership, and I think that what, one of the mistakes that America made was, uh, I call it the Lebanonization of Iraqi politics. Early on, Bremer started with the, we're going to have this many seats this for this many guys, seats this for many. this this and that and then we began cultivating the leadership of the sect groups uh, as if they were the spokespersons for the group and and uh, the the outcome was inevitable that people would play their strong suit and their strong suit was you know fear of the other and that's what they that's what they used and it marginalized the the moderates and those yeah. who had more secular inclinations but and I that's agree. the danger of going into a country whose history and culture you don't understand precisely and and, and I agree I mean, I I do think that the we're not going to go back to the to the worst days of the civil war I mean I do believe that the Iraqis have sort of stared into the abyss and they don't want to go back there um, but the question becomes, how do they resolve some of these differences? How do they at least, maybe outright resolution is, is too tall of an order, but it is a degree of accommodation. Or a level the of various, tolerance that doesn't exactly. accommodate violence. And, and, and can they, you know, can they in this Lebanonization model um, uh, keep, keep to the good days of Lebanon, or does this sort of slip back to some of the, the bad periods? And if we've seen from Lebanon's history, you know, it's sort of like a sine wave. And, and how do you keep that from repeating itself in a place like Iraq. Mr. Maliki, uh, while not directly responding to your poll, almost is as far as the concerns, the fears, when he said this week, nothing has changed with the withdrawal of American forces from Iraq on the security level because basically it's been on our hands already. Yeah. Is this just trying to make people feel uh, a sense of security or do they really have a, a greater handle on this than some of our worst fears suggest they might not? I, I think that Al Maliki has a handle on sufficient amount of security control to maintain power personally um, power but not security for the people. for the rest of the country no and and I think that um, he has a legitimacy problem um, 
in the polling that we did, his numbers are lower than that of some other leaders in the country. Um, certainly uh, among the Sunni population, almost non-existent favorable ratings. Same thing among the Kurds. Uh, his ranking among Shia is lower than Muqtada al-Sadr and lower than, uh, than Ayyad al-Awi even. Um, he has a problem, but what he does is he has power. Uh, and he controls the internal security services, he controls the defense forces, he controls those ministries, he hasn't surrendered them, which has become a political problem, but he has the ability to, su to surmount that. People are looking at him as the new Saddam um, and, and afraid that he's never going to surrender power. Uh, I don't know where that goes, but I, 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 don't, I don't believe that um, when he speaks about sufficient security control that he's actually talking about being able to... Uh, to, to to make the country whole as much as it is maintain power. Gentlemen, we only have about a minute left, but I want to ask you something that was spurred by uh, your comment, Raj, about what the narrative is. What, what is the mission accomplished narrative? What, what is the accurate narrative on the circumstance of the, or on the occasion of the United States withdrawal? Well, I think, I think the domestic narrative here in the United States is that President Obama fulfilled a promise that he made uh, during the campaign. Um, and so he will frame this as, I'm doing what I promised I, I would do. Campaign promise, mission accomplished. Exactly. Uh, Security-wise, it's still too early to tell. And I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the true assessment of all of this will take some years to play out. But I, but I do think that the, the alternative, keeping 3,000 or 5,000 troops there, won't fundamentally alter the arc of the, the history of Iraq that is to be written over the next several years. Okay, we have about 30 seconds for the Jim Zogby narrative. It, it was a total failure in every way, shape, and form. It should not have been fought, and we will not have success until there's accountability for those who got us into it in the first place. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.